listening to the Top Music Guitar Podcast, the show for guitar teachers to learn about the craft of teaching great guitar lessons that students love. If you're looking to start or expand your studio and make guitar teaching your full-time dream job, you've come to the right place. Each week, you'll get to hear from some of the top guitar teachers from around the globe and get their best tips and experiences so that you too can build your own dream studio. I'm your host, Michael, and I've founded one of the top guitar schools in Australia, written a best-selling curriculum, and I mentor guitar teachers. I'm excited to share my expertise with you and the wisdom of all the experts we interview. Make sure to subscribe so you don't miss any future episodes. Let's get into it. Hello, everyone, and welcome to another episode of the Top Music Guitar Podcast. Today, I've got a real treat, a great friend of mine, someone who I refer to as the speed demon from the north, and that is my good friend, Gottfried, uh, all the way from Norway. Gottfried, welcome to the Top Music Guitar Podcast. Hello, Michael. Thanks for having me on here. Thank you for coming. So I've asked Gottfried today because he is literally probably the fastest guitar player that I know, and I wanted to have a conversation with him about practice particularly in the realms of, of speed and technicality, because I feel like he's you know, one of the biggest experts on that kind of thing because he's done it. And I'm sure when he starts playing for you a bit later, you're going to be blown away by simply how fast he is. And you know, I don't know, I haven't chatted with Gottfried for a while. I know I've become I'm really, really slack in this technical area of my playing, but uh, this guy's absolutely sharp, sharp as a tack. So Gottfried, can you give the listeners a brief overview of your story so far, the journey from a guitar player to a teacher, and then you know from there onwards? Well, so I play guitar now, but I actually started off playing bass very early, very early age, I would say around six, seven, eight years old. I was playing in orchestras and uh, a jazz band through the local music school, and I didn't actually pick up the guitar until I was... Uh, 16 or something. I dabbled for a bit and I didn't actually get serious about it until I was around 20 years old, I would say, three, four years later. Though. By that time, when I was 20, I started to progress quite fast and uh, I decided to pursue teaching as a career. I've taught hundreds and hundreds of people of the course of the seven years when I run my school. And uh, at this point, I think I've seen it all when, <laughs> when it comes to, you know, facing challenges with uh, guitarists having problems with uh, playing the guitar. About the, uh, the situation as of right now, I'm not teaching. I went to university. I was a, a full-time self-employed guitar teacher for seven years. Why stop? Well, there's multiple factors at play there that decided me to uh, take a step in another direction. But to sum it all up, the vocation that I'm in currently right now, I have a lot more free time to actually pursue music and practice my instrument and all of that. Uh, and uh, the whole reason me going into teaching to begin with, uh, begin with was so that I would have the freedom to practice more, and that turned out not to be the case. <laughs> so I... Uh, Dipped my toes in for a bit for seven years, and then I went back to doing something else. Yeah, and uh, I'm obviously a big advocate for you know making music your your one and only thing if that's what you want to do. But there's definitely times where you know I've just done eight hours of lessons, and the last thing I want to do is pick up my guitar and play. So we're facing a similar sort of burnout where you, you got into teaching, thinking, yeah, this is going to be the solution to all my problems. It's just going to be music, 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 and then you found out you're falling out of love with it. Oh, yeah. Tell me about it. (laughs) That's pretty much what happened. I mean, I live in a small city, uh, getting other teachers. I mean, that was not a factor for me. So I was basically the one man army. I was doing the free consultation intro kind of thing. And then I was teaching Mondays to Fridays, Saturdays off, and then 12 hours on, you know, Sunday. And at some point, we need to meet up with a, you know, uh, in-laws and have dinner over there. And that's going to be on Saturday. So when am I going to get to practice? I mean, <laughs> and there's always stuff to do. So, uh, yeah, I sort of agree with you big time. Yeah. And, you know, for some of the entrepreneurial minded people, you just have to have that trade off. Do I want to make lots of money? And it's definitely a good way of making lots of money. But if you find out your personal practice suffering and music is your one and only goal, it's getting that right balance of saying, all right, well, can I make what I need off 10 to 20 hours of working? If so, fantastic. But if not, as you've done, it's okay to go back to another path that you find you know, gives you that freedom of time to be able to do what you want. So have you found that's been much better since making that change? In short, yes. Yes, I would say so. It's um, To put it in a little bit more perspective, it's not a day job that I have. It's uh, 
it's an on and off job, on off job. I mean, I leave work at work, but I have a lot of freedom when it comes to uh, my hours. So um, a work week would be perhaps like uh, 32 hours for me. And that's a tremendous decrease of time that I spent working in comparison with a business where it could be like, I don't want to drop numbers that are unrealistic, but a lot more than 32. Let's just put it that way. 100%. And you know, there is that joke saying an entrepreneur is someone who stops working 40 hours in a week for someone else so they can work 80 hours in a week for themselves. So I totally understand. (laughs) There's definitely times where you can go, oh man, this would be so much easier if it was just me. And like definitely throughout COVID in the last last two years we've gone through where it's just like, like, what are we doing all this for? Like raising a business, all these people, you've got to support all these extra pressures and responsibilities you have. Sometimes it's so much easier just to be you or just to work for someone else. And that's not to put, you know, anyone down. There's so many different ways you can skin a cat, you know, proverbially, you just got to find the one that works for you and gives that freedom. And if that means working for someone else that gives you the security and time and the hours that you need, you know, there's no judgment there. In fact, you know, at the end of the day, if it is a means to the end of you getting to do what you you love more, then by all means, go for that path. And I think that's unfortunately what too many people get sucked into. I don't want to shoot myself in the foot because I'm moving into the online teacher training space as well. But ultimately, you've got to find the uh, the path that gets you where you want to go. Uh, but getting back on track, um, you're one of the fastest guitar players I know. How many notes a minute can you play? Should have got should have asked me a couple of years ago. <laughs> a couple of years ago, or a good number of years ago, I did. If we're talking notes per minute here, it would be two thousand, and that's yeah. It, it sounds like a fantasy, but um, breaking that down, I think that would be so thousand notes, half a minute. That would be roughly thirty, I think, notes a second, a little bit more, if my math is correct, and that's a lot. Can I do that with all techniques? No, I don't. Th- <laughs> I don't think it's possible. I'll try to do the best I can in that ballpark with the technique that I did it with. Allow me to change the mic real quick and let's hear me screw up. Uh, all right, here we go. <laughs> so something like that. Let me switch back. So, was that 2,000 notes per minute? Exactly, I don't know, but it's some something along those lines. So I said, can you can you do this? With, can I do this with all techniques? No, I, I I don't think it's possible. There's a lot of circulation on YouTube. I mean, this was years ago. Flight of the Bumblebee. Some dude is playing that on 999 beats per minute. So that's four notes every beat. So that's 4,000 notes per minute i mean and what do you do on like 50 downstrokes and upstrokes a second i mean come on <laughs> there's just some techniques that you cannot do in in those speeds i think alternate picking on the same string i said that's just not going to be possible pattern i played there was like a five note per string kind of thing and that's very easy to build that kind of speed oh well it's not that easy but it's much easier to build speed with those patterns, uh, I feel like there's a level of control that's involved that's achievable in comparison with, you know, playing maybe a pentatonic scale, two note per string, up and down at the same speed. It's much more complex because you got, well, less fingers involved and um, you have to be picking every note and, uh, and all of that stuff. But yeah, 2000 notes per minute, that would be like the absolute balls out speed limit that it. I have or I reached so far. Yeah. So, you know, insane kind of stuff. And often most people give up, you know, well before then, or you hear numbers like that and you just go, oh, that's, that's impossible. You can't play that fast, but obviously there's a very dedicated pursuit of of going into that kind of speed. So what kind of led you to pursuing speed and technique to the degree at which you did pursue it? Well, it certainly was or is still an obsession of mine. Play the fastest and become feared by all the other guitarists. <laughs> well, j- jokes aside, it's more of it's actually self-expression. I think there's this very particular aspect or ver- uh, variant of intensity in music that can only be accessed by speed. 
And this is something that I'm looking for in my compositions, for example. I want to harness that type of intensity uh, and be able to use that to my advantage. Do I use that tool all the time? No. Uh, do I overuse it? Perhaps. Uh, I don't think so. But used with good taste, it can add a sense of awe uh, to the listener. Um, and that's why I do it. And I like it too. I mean, it's fun. 100%. You know, some people like fast cars. Some people like going to the gym and, and working on their bodies and lifting heavy weights and, and chasing that, you know, personal perfection or, or what is the best version of me and how can I get to that next level? Is it any different with working on speed? I don't know. You tell me. <laughs> like, like you said, it's just a, a form of expression. And yeah. um, there is that feel versus technique debate. And I've heard people say, you know, you got to play, play with feel and other people like you got to you know, play with fast. I'm always of the opinion of, um, you know, once you can play fast and you can play with feel, then you can decide whether one is better or why not get the best of both worlds and have both in your play. But what are your thoughts on the whole feel versus technique? Talk about an affected discussion. <laughs> I think it might have started out many, many years ago as a legitimate critique to a musician overplaying. And now it gets used and thrown around, uh, thrown around by people suffering from an inferiority complex. <laughs> as I said before, I use speed as a tool for expression. Maybe not in that demonstration, but I mean, come on, that was a demonstration. And there's, there's many, many guitarists that use virtuosity in that way. I mean, Guthrie Govan, for example, I think that's the best guitar player alive today. He shreds everyone's ass off, and people who don't know anything about music thinks he's fantastic. And there's other people like him. I mean, Rick Graham, Tom Quayle, Martin Miller, Andy James, Stephen Toronto is a new guy. It's incredible. Uh, the list goes on. I mean, all the way back to the classical era, we had Beethoven ripping it on the piano with his Moonlight Sonata, the third movement. And other composers like him in that era. And then there's Paganini. <laughs> yeah. The underlying notion and presupposition, I suppose, uh, that some people seem to have, that you either use one or the other. Uh, I mean, playing technical phrases and lines automatically equates to you having no feeling. Uh, yeah, bro, I don't think so. Yeah, and one of my favorite fast players that I you know, first got into was Ingve Melmstein. And some people just go, oh, you know, he's, he's just shreds, he just plays fast. But there's like an intense kind of... I don't want to call it anger, but there's this like desperation to his playing that I hear in, in the speed runs that he does. And it just, I think that's one of like the, the most intensely emotional fast playing examples that you can think of. So there's definitely that element of emotion that gets put into it. I could take another angle of, on the Malmsteen. I mean, it can be, there, there can be something to the criticism. We um, play devil's advocate here. Uh, there, there's a lot of polarizing debate about, around many guitarists. And Ingvar Malmsteen, for example, if there's a leading character that had been forced to endure critiques, ingvi has got to be a strong contender. My take on him is that the man can clearly play. At least back in the day, he was a beast of a guitarist. I think the problem it may be context. I mean, if we take a look at Ingvi's instrumental songs they're more often than not platforms for him to show off on the compositions are quite simple especially by today's standards and i can somewhat agree that perhaps it would be in better taste to uh, play with more restraint in some cases in some scenarios but that does not mean at all that the guy has no feel whatever the hell that means because it clearly does i agree with you and one more thing of all the hundreds and hundreds of students that I've had, the ones that, you know, in some form brought this debate to class, none of them could really play anything technical. Well, that just comes back to once you've once you can do it, then you uh you know, you earn your right to critique or be critical or, or voice your opinion. <laughs> <laughs> There's far too much good music out there for you to get worried about the kind of music that other people like or enjoy or or worrying about who is the best. And at the end of the day, I think too many people get drawn into, uh, you know, debates about who's the best guitar player. I wonder if that's a guitar player thing because we tend to um, – I was having this conversation with um, Tim Topham, the other uh, – the, the owner of, Pop, of Top Music, 
And we're talking about how guitar players are a completely different breed to any other kind of instrument, instrumentalist, um, simply because we so fiercely debate about who is the best or things like that. I've never heard piano players like arguing over who is the best piano player in the world. And no other instrumentalist t- tends to have like more than 10 guitars and still be dreaming about the next one they're going to buy. <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. Now, speak, speaking of guitars, you've got um that Loretta guitar. Is that the one you've got there? This is the prototype. It's a very simple guitar. Uh, it's a five-way, well, when it works, five-way toggle switch. One uh, volume knob. There's uh, uh, I totally for, uh, forgot. It's fan fret kind of thing going on here. Don't ask me about the scale length. I actually can't remember uh, off the top of my head. Fishman, Fluence pickups, ebony fretboard. Yeah, it's very simple, pleasing aesthetic to this guitar. It's uh, I think it's very heavily based on a Strandberg, the body of a Strandberg. Only that they have this up thing going on here that's not a part of the strandberg model but the horn here and the the shape here in the body it's uh yeah it's definitely got a resemblance of a strandberg uh, body um i saw for the, i saw uh, for what, but not uh watching it's kind of like a strandberg on the bottom and a whale on yeah. the top that's how i think about it back to you with uh, a say. far cooler pointy headstock uh and i i bought this guitar because i saw um, What's his name? Uh, I mentioned him before. Uh, Stephen Toronto, this insane fusion shredder guy, play on it. And I thought I would get his skills by buying it, but I'm afraid that's just not the case. I should have learned by now. I was going to say, yeah, you must have bought the wrong one. Better go buy another one. So, what do you, um, in terms of the, the whole field debate, we can move on from that and just talk about general practicing. So, for the people who are stuck in the the less is more approach, slow down, son, you've got to play it with feel. What can these kind of people do to start practicing speed and technique? Practicing speed and practicing technique. Well, we're talking that specifically or like general approach to practicing here. Or Let, Let's go general first, then we can dive into specific a bit. A lot of people do stuff wrong when it comes to, I have a lot to say about this, <laughs> but um People practice the wrong things, the wrong way, out of order. I'll try to keep this structure, but I'll start off by saying that, in my opinion, it's it's a, certainly a very complex matter. I, I actually think guitar in and of itself is a very complicated subject, uh, or it certainly can be, especially in the beginning of your journey, you know, trying to figure out what the hell you're doing. And what makes it so complex, it's, it's difficult to determine not only the the good stuff from the bad stuff. And what I mean by that is simply the source of information. If your source of information is coming from TikTok, you have a lot of garbage that you have to sift through versus working with someone like you, for example, who's got a long experience of doing this stuff and knows probably exactly what to do because you've, you've seen it all before. And there's also another angle to this. There's a lot of good stuff out there, out there on the web and you don't need to do all of it. Why? Because if you want to become Ingve Malmsteen number 39,504, you don't need to be able to do finger picking in the style of country roads. <laughs> Maybe a bit of a dumb example, but because it's so obvious, but what about alternate picking versus economy picking? In my opinion, you clearly need both if you're aiming to be a good, solid shredder guy. But I mean, how do you go about this? To make a calculated decision and i think it comes down to the future you the vision of who you want to be as a guitarist the sounds you want to be able to produce once you got that down you got something of a pathway lying in front of you and that pathway should take you in contact with all the techniques theories and concepts that you need to become the guitarist that you seek to be and you know these techniques theories and concepts and whatever you want to call them. They're really components that are required in the recipe of, uh, of this future you. And uh, this just further adds to the complexity of this subject. I mean, how do you really know what components are really required to construct the future you? Or what about this? What if you do all of these things, uh, you work your ass off, 
you come to realize that you're not actually moving towards your goal. Perhaps a component here is that you're not even aware of is missing. Now that's scary. That happened to me, not with technique, but you know, something else, guitar related. And this is why there are professionals such as yourself help, helping people out. I think YouTube and internet uh, um, at the same time is best and worst source of information. Unless you're a fairly advanced guitarist, you're already you're gonna have a hard time navigating through the worldwide domain of all this stuff. Uh, so, I mean, summing up that in a nutshell, I think starting out stuck with a guitar, get professional help. I mean, a teacher or a very well-made course, or if you're an advanced guitarist but you're still stuck, get a consultation from a real pro. I mean, we're talking top level world class figure out these issues that's like general practice approach I, that's my philosophy on it yeah fantastic and, and there is no substitute for you know professional help someone who can identify where you are identify where you want to go and help you know bridge the gap between where you are and where you need to go and who can yeah. lay out a path identify all the problems and and what you said just cut out all the nonsense cut out all the stuff that's not related to what you're doing. And again, I, I totally agree on the YouTube thing. There's some absolutely fantastic stuff on YouTube, but unfortunately there's 10 times the amount of terrible content. And that's only been exacerbated by the current lockdown and pandemic because basically everyone at home with a camera is like, I'm a YouTube teacher now. So there's just yep. so much stuff out there. And again, some of these people have really good intentions, but they just don't have the experience there and don't even know themselves. Um, and I know like, so you're sort of uh, touching on and alluding to the fact that, hey, what is the future me? What is the ideal guitar player that I want to become? And how do I build my way into that? Whereas so many people are just stuck in the realm of this is how I learned from my teacher who learned from their teacher who learned from their teacher, go back to, you know, the history of guitar. And they're still teaching everyone the same old tried and true method. You wouldn't get health advice from a doctor in the 60s because they'd say, oh, yeah, take some cocaine and smoke this cigarette and you'll be cigarette and you'll be fresh. <laughs> Like now, you know, they look back at that and go, Whoa, what were you thinking kind of thing. So um, the same thing with guitar teaching. There's just an evolution of lessons and so much more that goes into it. So maybe before we go into the specifics of speed, you alluded to this kind of like vision. You know, and, and this is something I've seen you talk about in the past on stage about mindset and creating that ideal musician that you want to become and then going and building it. So can you tell us a little bit more about that? In my experience, a lot of people that come through the door, of course, have problems with uh, music-related problems, but they're sort of interconnected psychologically. Uh, and what I mean by that is like the people seem to have this plethora of limiting beliefs and thoughts about themselves that in some way or form just acts as self-sabotage. Uh, and I did do uh, a talk about this uh, some years ago. And uh, that talk essentially was about all of these inner thoughts that are either something that, you know, actively think about yourself, but most of, most of the, uh, the time they're unspoken thoughts inside of your head. And there's different levels to it, but to very shortly sum this up there's um about four levels to this um and i would say that the first level this is essentially um thoughts that are something along the lines of i can't i can't do it i i mean i suck i i mean the worst possible thing that you could think about yourself or say about yourself and uh, to preface this, I should have said this before, but if we're taking, if we're talking in the Malmsteen, since he was, you brought him up before, do you really think that Ingve Malmsteen is a guy that thinks to himself like, oh, well, I suck, or I can't? No, the, the, the thoughts that he have about himself, they got to be through the roof. They got to be through the roof positive. Okay. I haven't, you know, had a class about this in my um, <laughs> at my school, 
I think a lot of people would need it, but at the same time, I think it would be kind of weird to have a class about this. But I've sort sort of you know uh, slipped this in between the lines when I realized that oh, there's this certain person that or certain type of people that really need to change the way they think about themselves and think about their guitar playing. So there's, in short, there's levels to this where the first level, the one to two, that's negative. So the second one is like, oh, I should practice or I, I should uh, commit to um, this uh, practice regime or, uh, you know, whatever. But that's often leading them into a type one thought which is well what's the use well i suck anyway so or i'm useless i'll never learn whereas the the level three and four they are more positive or they're essentially that three is more positive and four is like the most positive you can be so level three is like well i no longer put put things off or i never skip practice or that's a more positive thought that you could implant into your brain instead of, well, I should practice. Just decide it, well, I'm never going to skip practice. Okay, that's level three. And then level four is like, that's really the kind of thoughts that build the better you or you know, like the future you. Like, I am the kind of guy that, you know, attack the problems that occur in my guitar playing. I'm the kind of guy that, well, I forgot to mention that these thoughts have to be, you know, some way correlated to um, reality. I mean, you can't think, oh, I am God, I am God. <laughs> it's it's difficult Maybe to explain. Does think, think that. <laughs> well, he probably does, doesn't it? It's got like a level 10 speech, I am God. Well, it's diff difficult to put in words, uh, for me at least, but... Uh, there's certain, there, there's certainly a psychological element to this, and I've never met someone who, I mean, plays extraordinary, extraordinarily well, but have you know, crippling self doubt or self talks about themselves. It's just not compatible. So that's something that you've got to get rid of if you want to progress. One hundred percent, and something I've noticed with all the the people that have ever gone to a super high level with me they wanted it before they came to me yeah they they said i want to become this sort of technical fast player and you're the guy who i think can help me or i've heard can help me and then we go and do it whereas yep. most people who quit are like oh i like guitar i don't think i'm going to be good at it but i'd like to give it a try and there's two i'd like to try versus I want to do it, help me get there. Those two perspectives and attitudes say everything. And the, the super successful ones, it's like they already know they're going to arrive there. It's like they've booked the ticket on the holiday. They just haven't taken the journey yet, but they know they're going to get to the destination. That's kind of what they're doing. Just two, two, three, four years out, they know they're going to get there. They just yeah. need to complete the journey. So yeah, there's a hundred percent different difference in the apprehensive, oh, maybe I can do it. I can kind of do this because they're the people that drop off, you know, drop like flies when hard work is required of them. But the other guys will, you know, do anything because this is what I want. And uh, I totally know what you meant before. Like, you know, you've got to slip some things in because this personal development kind of stuff, this visioneering, this future self kind of stuff, you know, it's a bit woo-woo. And most average people, not, not average in a detractory way, but most of the common population's mindset about that is you know oh it's all positive thinking you know people are just trying to take advantage of you or yeah no you can't really think your way into positive things happening but you know for those people that do invest into it and it clicks with it they can get tremendous results but it's literally about going this is the old me and this is how old me behaved and this is the new me and here's my new set of beliefs and if i'm a guitar player this is what I do. These are the beliefs that I adopt. I have to practice regularly. I have to believe in myself. I have to want to be aiming for something. And the people that change this behavior are the ones become successful. So as teachers, often we're trying to teach them, but if we really want to be successful, we have to change their beliefs about themselves, about their ability to achieve and to change their behavior. Because you can give, you, everyone knows this, you can give 10 people the exact same lessons, the exact same approach, the exact same course. Two people go really good 
two people will drop off immediately. Yeah. Like in the middle will be a big broad spectrum of results. But the guys who did really well had completely different behavior to the people in the middle and the bottom end. And if we can try and influence that behavior, that's going to increase our likelihood of more people getting into that you know upper spectrum there. 100%. Had any... Um, had you previously tried to be a little bit more overt with your students and the positivity stuff? Or? Uh, you mean if I had been avoiding it or? Oh, I meant, sorry. So you obviously talked about not having done a class, um, but have slip, <laughs> slipped a few things in. So how, how do you go about slipping a few of these things? I haven't really had an exact procedure for it. I, it's more, <laughs> it's been more of winging it. And uh, if, if I know it is an entire class is freaking out over this, I could be more direct, but if it's just one person in that class, I don't want to you know, call that person out because then they'll be gone. <laughs> They're not going to be there next week, or at least I think. But if I notice there's a vast majority of people in that class, you know, you could kind of slow it down and, you know, just change gears totally. And uh, I don't know, I remember one class where I just asked, well, does this seem impossible? Let's be honest. Let's just... Does this seem impossible? And there's a long silence, like five seconds, and then someone says, like, maybe not impossible, but very hard. <laughs> and then, I don't know, it just kind of eases into the conversation, and I just go from there. Um, I haven't had this conversation as a class many times, maybe, you know, four or five times throughout my career, but individually, yeah, that's... It's an easier discussion, I feel like, to approach an individual about it instead of an entire class. Yeah, and it's obviously each individual has their own uh, situations and, and goals and dreams and ambitions and limiting beliefs. So obviously when you can have these kind of conversations with them, it is a much more personal thing, which probably does need to be done uh, you know, privately. Sure. I mean, you could go into things like you know, goal setting is a bit more broad, and um, talking about, you know, narrowing down into if you're this kind of player, like if I was talking, running my Thursday night heavy metal session, then we can always talk more about goals and, and mindsets and things like that. Those advanced players take to it a lot more, again, because their behavior is already more conducive to, I want to get ahead. But if someone's coming in for their first uh, acoustic guitar lesson, you're like, okay, we've got to cut out all this stuff and do this, do this, and one hour a day practice, you know, they're never coming back. They're going to think it's way too intense for them. You find, um, again, you're really high up on the, the talent spectrum in terms of speed and things. Did you find you were attracting those kind of players or were you still getting a lot of broad general guitar players coming through the business which you had to cater to? In my, ca in my case, I mean, I kind of had a mo monopoly on, <laughs> on, uh, on teaching. There were, I mean, there's other teachers in, in the city as well, but um, if you were serious about you know, actually taking lessons, then people would talk and then refer them to me. And I got, I got every type of student. But in this in this city, there's there's actually some really good guitar players, and uh, I've had a lot of them come to me specifically <clears throat> because they have a. Well, as I was uh, talking about uh, before, uh, it's like a case of an advanced player uh, who's got, he just can't figure his stuff out. I mean, he's stuck. He doesn't know exactly what to do. He's been stuck for five years or something. And he, he needs that input. He needs that consultation. But um, I ha I've had a lot of young kids that just got obsessed and I'm not sure if it had something to do with me. I think it partly did. I later learned many years later that uh, apparently I had a very good track record compared to many other teachers of uh, having people reach that, you know, thousand note per minute uh, threshold, if you will. Yeah, I've had, uh, I think it was 15 or 16 people uh, that uh, surpassed that threshold that stayed with me for a very long time i don't count you know <laughs> the ones that were already advanced and then came in for you know a consultation and stayed for two months and i mean i don't count those kinds of guys because that's not they already did the uh, the work themselves so you mentioned the 1000 note per minute clubs that's obviously people who can play uh, a thousand notes per minute 
four notes per second at uh, four notes per beat at two fifty BPM or higher. Was it triplets at three thirty four beats per minute? So some serious sort of numbers there. Is this something like uh, when they first come in, you introduce them to this club and say, "This is what we're going to work towards." Is it kind of like geared up uh, to motivate them towards there? No, I just put, <laughs> I just put these kids and young men and slightly older men or <laughs> whoever they are. I put them in the same room and they do all the work themselves. <laughs> I mean, they, it, that's really it. I mean, they they push themselves and they want to impress each other, and it's it's certainly a competitive thing, but a positive thing, a positive uh, level of competition, I would say. Many of them, you know, I wouldn't say started bands, but they were definitely jamming outside of lessons. I'm, I mean, more power to them. So um, I, I think connecting people together that have similar drives and want to achieve the same things or want to do the same things, you know, activities, jamming and whatnot, I think that's one of the most powerful tools uh, that can really, you know, propel and uh, propel students uh, forward. Uh, towards growth uh, instead of them just instead of it just being you know a student and you putting them in a group of um, like-minded people that you know compete with each other that kind of thing I think that does wonders for people 100% and I think it's so much goes into the environment that you create especially you know with group-based learning when you get a bunch of men and I noticed you said boys and men and I've known just this in my school that around about 12 to 16 is when boys you know tend to switch on and you know hormones kick in they become competitive and it's funny because guitar and you even mentioned this earlier I want to play so fast that I scare off all the other guitar players like boys and young men they gravitate towards this technical bass playing as a way of asserting dominance or personal you know uh, just the same as going to the gym but it really does inspire them to compete with each other and, and raise to a higher standard and yeah. Not saying girls and women can't reach this standard, but they tend to do it for a different reason. I've noticed a lot more girls are just, hey, I really love this song and I learned it. And, you know, they come to the lessons and they, they talk a bit more. It's much more socially focused on, hey, I'm having fun. I'm connecting with people and I'm learning yeah. music because I like music, whereas guys are like, yeah, teach me to play faster. <laughs> <laughs> and have this, they have this wonderful connection where it's this one-upmanship kind of thing. Oh, Oh well, Jeremy got really fast this week, so I better go home and practice so that I can play something and just show off for him. So it's kind of oh yeah. Have you found this similar dynamic in your school? Yeah, that's exactly it. That's exactly what you're describing. And it's the same kind of like I did some boxing lessons when I was younger, and it was the exact same vibe at the boxing club. And I've done football and a few other sports. It's the exact same vibe as you know being in the gym. I've just been yep. able to recreate that with some of my um, you know shred kind of students and give them the same atmosphere that they're looking for in sport or they're looking for at gym or they're you know doing with their high school buddies uh but i noticed you, you mentioned before you sort of give them the stuff and then they put in all the work so what kind of things are you doing just to set them up both in terms of materials in terms of routines in terms of the stuff they need to learn what are you doing to help them build up this technique and, and speed kind of based very broad but very great question uh, and I think the most important thing is to fir first set it straight that building technique and building speed, it's, it's not about gnashing your teeth and clenching your butt cheeks to get another 4 BPM on your scale run. It's, it's not about you know, pushing through pain. Uh, it's not about mindless repetitions. Uh, it somehow allows you to one day in the future be able to play at the speed that you want. Um, make sure everybody understands that it's about maximizing efficient time spent on eliminating relevant weaknesses. Staying focused on the process of continually refining things over the long term. Having the basic fundamentals of your technique not, you know, come crashing down when you step on the gas pedal. I segue here to how I used to work with students that I had in my school. And when you, when you increase your speed, uh, or working to increase your speed, you've got to figure out why you can't yet play at the speed that you want to be playing at. So that's step number one. Uh, that can be a painful step because in some cases it's just not 
the one thing that's keeping you back. It could be four or five aspects of that technique that fall apart when you step on that gas pedal. Uh, so that's step number one. Uh, once you've identified at least one part of the core issue here, I mean, the weakest link in this chain, you've got to start working on it. Um, it's a bit difficult to put in general terms here because depending on problem, you could attack it in different ways, I suppose. Uh, but let's say a flawed general version of this would be to alternate playing it fast and pl practicing it slow refer to this as you know testing and practicing when you do this you have to be extremely aware of this problem that you discovered both high and low speeds um high speed this problem is obviously going to be highly present um, but it's gonna it has this tendency to slip in unnoticed at lower speeds if you don't engage your brain so this is kind of mind over matter stuff you need to by willpower um, make your hands do the things that you want them to do feel the th feel the way you want them to feel and you do this for a couple of repetitions and then go fast to see if the problem moved to another node or something along those lines i'm looking at the topic of building speed i'd like to see it as really two different aspects it's the technique itself which refers to the you know fundamentals and them being executed correctly and then there's, you know, speed itself. But talking about fundamentals here, um, this is, you know, fretting the notes with a fingertip correctly, pressing it down, fretting it, pressing down ex precisely behind the fret. You fret with the least possible amount of tension instantly. You relax fingers off of the fretboard, you know, that kind of stuff. So that's like the fundamentals that, you know, obviously need to be practiced and mastered. And then the other part I consider to be just in and of itself. Some people might think this is ludicrous, but <laughs> I think uh, I can tell you from experience that, yes, uh, speed is a byproduct of accuracy on the fundamentals, and it's a prerequisite for having the potential to build real speed. However, if you obsess about these fundamentals, um, chances are you're going to get stuck there. I'm sure you know guitarists that have been playing for years and years stuck at low le slower um, levels of speed. Uh, and uh, I'm also sure you know guitarists that reach uh, kids, you know, teenagers often do this, uh, reach a speed where it's like, how should I put it? It's chaotic noise. It's like slop. <laughs> um, and typical guitar examples of guitarists uh, that might be forgetting about you know the fundamentals. They focus only on the speed. So I think you need both. And uh, something I do is called uh, fragmentation. And what that essentially is is that you what whatever the issue you have uh, with you know like a sweep picking pattern or a scale sequence or whatever, you essentially divide it up into um, sequence of notes so you would actually they was this was probably better for a demonstration here you got something to add i know awesome <laughs> we'll, we'll listen and learn. Melt, don't melt, melt my face off oh this is just going to be slow let me just switch to microphone um, so let's say we got uh, a very simple pattern we got uh, we got no amp to begin with here we go so we got just a short scale sequence of six notes. Let's say that's the exercise or the thing that you want to increase your speed with. Um, instead of just playing the sequence over and over again at you know a fast tempo or a slower tempo, this approach is essentially just playing. So there's six notes: one, two, three, four, five, six. You cut it up into smaller segments, fragment, if you will. Let's say we're playing just the first three notes as fast as you can. Now I made a mistake, but you know that's the way 
uh, you approach it with fragmentation, you play really fast, as fast as you can play, and maybe you discover like, oh, there's, there's something going on in there. But if everything works fine, you move on from the note one, two, three, to instead two, three, four. So that would be instead of, it would be that. And then it, people who are, are listening can't see the string change here, but there's a string change in there. So by moving this fragment of three notes one step ahead, so you essentially skip the first note, you might reveal a weak link in this uh, big chain that you have, the exercise, if you will. If not, you simply move the fragment along uh, another step. So you start on the third note and you play three, uh, four, and five. <laughs> And you play that as fast as possible. That might reveal a different problem. Uh, what's important to note here, when you move this fragment along, don't change up the fingering. Keep the fingering exactly the same as if you were to play it, you know, in context. The same with the picking motions. Otherwise, this will never work. Okay, you have to keep it um, structured the same way as if you would play it in context. So you move it on and on and on and on and on. And once you feel like, oh, you know, I got this down with three notes, I can play every possible fragment of three notes, one, two, three, two, three, four, three, four, five, and so on. Well, you could go back to the starting point that you play one, two, three, four. So you have a fragment of four notes. So that would be and then you move that along. And so this is really what fragmentation is. You could apply it to any, you know, technical um scales, we picking arpeggio or whatever. And the idea is that you stretch this fragment longer and longer, okay? And the, the longer you stretch the fragment, the more difficult it's going to be to, you know, get every note clean and um, have it all in sync and not tense up, okay? But this is a really good way for someone to, to, you know, just sit by themselves. If, you, if you're working on something and you're not sure if you're doing it right or where the problem is, doing this will reveal a potential problem very fast, okay? And the way to fix it is also very easy. You simply you slow the speed down. You play the exact same fragment where the problem um, appeared. You play it slower, and since you're just playing perhaps three notes at one time, it's going to be very easy to locate exactly which note is um, uh, where the problem is occurring, on, uh, on which note the problem is occurring. And then you notice, oh, am I tensing up? Am I messing up the picking here? Am I missing the string, or am I not in sync? So uh, I found this to be a very, very, actually, let me switch back the microphone here. I, I found this to be a very useful uh, tool for uh, students to very efficiently practice on their own, because it's, it's very easy for them to detect problems and then to work on problems. The only downside I find with this uh, approach to practicing it's that it takes an extreme amount of brain power <laughs> uh, because it's um, it's it's very exhausting playing very fast and then very slow and then very fast again and then you test and then you move just these notes. I mean, I'm working with six notes here, but you could 
you could spend an enormous amount of time with just these six notes and it would be a waste of time. So I said a lot, but <laughs> that's a fragmentation. That's what I call it, a speed burst, some people call it, but that's the way I refer to it and approach it. And it's extremely useful. So for anyone uh, looking to build real speed, I would say this is one of the main exercises or strategies, I should say, that you, you should employ. Because if you want to, it's the same with, uh, uh, I don't know, power lifting. If you want to be able to lift heavy, you have to lift heavy. You can't lift a lightweight a thousand times and then expect to be able to pull 200 kilos off the floor. And it's just not going to work. It's the same thing here with the practice uh, with the speed if you want to be able to play fast at some point dude you got to be you got to play fast 100 percent. so some awesome stuff there Gottfried. and you know anyone listening to this is going to get an enormous uh, wealth of knowledge out of what you just uh, imparted there we are going to wrap it up here so if you could impart one final piece of wisdom upon a guitar player or a guitar teacher listening to this what would that be use fragmentation <laughs> uh, but um Trust yourself, be honest with yourself. First and foremost, I would say be honest with yourself. So if you know or if you suspect there's a problem in there, especially if you know there's a problem in there, don't hide it from yourself. If you're recording and you notice like, oh, that clean, that take was not clean, don't shy away from it. You know what you're going to be working on. Don't shy away from it. If you really want to be able to shred and you want to, you know, um, truly impress people with your guitar playing if, if that's what you want to do. And there's no room for you to lie to yourself and be dishonest with yourself about the limits of your own ability. So be honest with yourself. Absolute fantastic words of wisdom there, Gottfried. Lastly, where can our listeners you know, follow you or find out more about what you're doing or if, if a new future project comes along, keep up to date with that? The absolute best place to follow me on would be Instagram. And uh, my, name is, my name on Instagram is Hexolydian. So that's not an actual scale. <laughs> it's my name on uh, Instagram. That's H-O-X. That's H-E-X-O. And then Lydian as in this case. So that's at Hexolydian, guys. Gottfried, thank you so much for coming on for sh- sharing the wonderful wealth of knowledge that you have. I feel like we only scratched the surface, so definitely want to have future conversations with you. But thank you so much for your time. I do appreciate it. It's great to see you. And for all the listeners, thanks again for tuning in. We'll look forward to seeing you in the next episode of the Top Music Guitar Podcast. Thanks very much, Gottfried. Thank you. If you enjoy this show and want to hear more of our work, be sure to subscribe to this podcast. For links and resources mentioned in this episode, including a free ebook on how to find more guitar students, visit us at www.topmusic.co slash guitar or check out the show notes. And lastly, thanks again for listening and we'll see you in the next episode.